I'm going to start to record. And Michael, I think anytime you want to proceed, you can do so. Perfect. Thanks so much, Kim. Let me just uh, get my screen sharing going. Sorry, I'm a little slow on the uptake today. I was on call last night and... <laughs> Your post-call. Oh, yeah, but There's being that... post-call is, is a very youthful thing, you know? Most people who are post-call are like in their 30s. So anyway. <laughs> oh, I... I... So within our within our group, I mean, you're on call for life, right? Until you I see, yeah, yeah. So there's there's nothing youthful about it. It just <laughs> it, it, uh, it's a it's given, a, yeah. It's a given, and you feel different with time, right? Yeah. Okay. But so it, it's nice to see you all today. It feels like just yesterday that we talked um about ethics um and the future of medicine, but it wasn't yesterday. It was the day before. So time flies by fast. Um, these were a take home points from a couple of days ago. We're gonna shift gears today and spend more time specifically talking about technologies. And I'll go through these points in a series. But I like reflective questions to begin with because I think it gets people thinking about a topic. So I'm gonna ask some questions and just ask for you to think about them yourself. What role do technologies have in our lives? How do we evaluate technologies? Meaning, what makes a good technology compared to a bad technology? Is it possible for a technology be technology to be good in different ways, but also to be bad in others? What properties must a technology have if it is to be an object of moral concern? Meaning a technology which I feel I have some responsibility towards it. What kind of technological world do we want to live in? If we want it to become really ethical, what kind of technological world do we want our children to live in? Do machines have the capacity for moral consciousness? What kind of humans do we want to become? Like yesterday, please feel free to jump in at any time. Um, it's always much more fun for these presentations if I'm not the only one talking. The way I structured this presentation is actually similar to in previous years, where I'm essentially taking the themes that we, we developed on Tuesday, but taking them more towards a technology perspective. So on Tuesday, we talked about as ethics being present in our day-to-day -day interactions. What I like to also say here now are that technologies are constitutive of our very being in the world. So something that's kind of interesting is, Kim, I've never met you in person, right? Right. I think yeah. now we've been doing this presentation or I've been able to come to your class for at least three years um, and we've never met. I don't know if you're tall, maybe you're six feet tall, maybe you're only four feet tall. I know we like the same kind of hats. I like kangaroo kind of <laughs> hats as well. But my whole sense of you, right? has been, been conditioned by way of this kind of an interaction, right? And that's, that's important to acknowledge, right? In any kind of a, a relationship is that technologies that we utilize actually condition our way of knowing one another, right? Now, you know, some people say, you know what? I'm not a very technological person, but I know students in this class know better than that. I think the students in this class know that even if you say you're not a technological person, that doesn't mean that the technologies don't actually affect your way of being in the world. So in a moment like this, where we're all joined in this common seminar from, I'm thinking all around Edmonton, maybe that's not true. Maybe there are students from outside of Edmonton joining too. We could ask the question, what about our, our, what about ourselves is not conditioned by technology? 
Can you think of any aspect of yourself that in some way is not touched by technology? That is purely so-called human. Anyone want to challenge me on this? I see Scott searching the sky as if the answer's there. It's not on the ceiling. So the philosophy of technology, um, you know, it's not a unified field by any stretch, but this is where you find this kind of thinking, these kind of discussions um, where people are asking, what role do things play in our technological culture? Should we assign agency or responsibility to technologies themselves? What effects do things have on us? How do technologies constitute our humanity? When I first got introduced to this idea, I was practicing as a pediatrician as a, at the time. Um, well, actually, I was in pediatric residency. And to be honest, at that point, I thought of all the different things that I was learning to use in a very instrumental way, right? What do I mean by an instrumental perspective to technology? I thought about my stethoscope as something I just put on and I take off, right? But ultimately, it's just a tool in my toolbox of being a physician that helps me to assess a particular child. And to be honest, I think many people are still stuck in this way of looking at technologies. And when something new comes out, the thought is, well, Obviously, we need it for our unit, for our program, for our practice, because it's new. It's going to make things better. It's going to make things easier, right? But sometimes we don't actually ask, well, how will that shape our interactions, not just in instrumental ways, meaning what makes something possible, but also in non-instrumental ways, right? So an instrumental perspective of technology would be revealed in phrases such as, Guns don't kill people, people kill people, right? Because the gun is viewed purely as a tool rather than recognizing that when you put a gun in the hand of someone, that changes the way in which they relate to someone else, right? It's more than just a thing. So from instrumental perspectives of technologies, we have singular transcendental perspectives. And this can be identified with a number of different philosophers at the turn of the century who started to speak about the danger of technology, right? Often technology with the capital T, as if all technologies are the same, as if the way that we relate um, to others, you know, using a gun compared to using an iPad is the same. They're simply technologies, sorry, simply technology, which isn't necessarily particularly helpful because we recognize in our contemporary world, we use so many different kinds of technologies and we should consider each and every one of them in their uniqueness, the unique way that they structure our being in the world. And this is really the empirical turn of technology studies. Does that make sense? So we no longer focus on technology, we focus on technologies. Within this empirical turn of technology, there's a number of different movements. Um, one of them that I find really helpful in my own work is known as post-phenomenology. So phenomenology basically describes an approach to continental philosophy, whereby the focus is on asking, how is it that we directly experience our being in the world, right? Um, how can we talk about a conscious experience, right? And it takes the ground um, of study as, as subjective reality, if you will. Post-phenomenology draws on phenomenology to say that the question that we should consider is, how is it that particular technologies condition our intentionality, meaning the way that we are conscious of the world, the way in which we interact with others? And post-phenomenology is very much geared toward the multiple ways that different kinds of technologies may mediate human experience. It can also be said that post-phenomenology privileges mediation over the subject or the object. So it's not so much the focus of 
the actor who uses the technology or the technology itself. It's rather, how does that technology situate itself in my encountering of another, for example? So we'll give some concrete examples. So a post-phenomenological perspective of this situation would say that there are multiple technologies that are operant here. Technologies that for the most part, we don't pay much attention to, but rather we regard them in their instrumental nature, but we should consider how they impact on others. So if you look at this picture, this is a picture from the NICU. I tried to cover up the name of the, the patient, right? With my little square. Uh, the parents gave permission for me to use this picture. Um, these are two parents reaching into their baby who's in an isolate, right? And in many ways, we could say that, you know, this isolate serves a function, right? It maintains the humidity uh, in a closed environment, knowing that extremely premature babies have um, immature aspects of their skin. So they can lose not just heat, but also use a lot of water, right? You can see a Billy Rubin light, right? Phototherapy light overhead treating jaundice for the baby, right? That also um, has an instrumental value. You can see on the side various infusion pumps that are delivering a combination of probably IV nutrition and different medications, right? All of them have instrumental value. A post phenomenological perspective would say, well, you know, that might be what they're designed for. But how is it that they actually structure our way of being in this environment? So it's not just that the isolate um, provides uh, a premature baby with warmth and humidity, but it, it also has a way in which it structures the way that families interact with their children. Right? So if you can imagine most parents, when they just have their child right after birth, what do they do? the child is placed into their arms. They hold their baby, right? But I'm hoping you can see that the isolate, the way it's structured, it discloses the child as present to the parents in a very particular way, right? So it mediates the parent's relation to their child. If they wanna touch their child, they need to reach in. It structures your body so you can only hold your child in a particular way. Your way of being with the child becomes one where the baby's always on display because they are seen through the, the plastic enclosure, right? So post-phenomenology, would, would, it helps us start to unpack the ethics of different technologies to look beyond simply what were they designed for. Don Eide, who's the kind of the father figure of post-phenomenology, American uh, philosopher. Uh, he's written, you know, can't even think of how many books and articles, right? And he describes kind of these four prototypical relations, right? And he says, most technologies we can understand in one of four ways. There are technologies that we use as a tool, right? So, you know, I pick up a hammer, I embody that technology, right? And when I pick up a hammer, everything becomes a nail, right? That's our, our kind of default way of now relating to the world, because I'm no longer thinking of holding the hammer, I'm simply thinking of striking something. If you don't believe me, give a hammer to a, a five-year-old and see what happens to your living room table, right? Other technologies we encounter in a hermeneutic manner, right? So they disclose the world to us. When I wake up in the morning and I get out of bed, I usually walk over to a little iPad screen we have on the wall. Um, and it tells me the temperature outside, what to expect. Do I need to wear a jacket today or a toque to cover my bald head, right? So it presents the world in a particular way, which is quite different than a, a technology that we embody. There are other technologies that we encounter as an other to ourselves, right? Uh, Alexa, turn up the music. Siri, uh, find the address of so-and-so, right? Tell me a joke, right? We talk at these technologies as if they're not just 
a thing. Um, this stupid whatever, right? Sometimes when technologies are broken, we encounter them in their alterity, if that makes sense. And then there are other technologies that are in the background of our life, right? So most of the time, if we're in a seminar, we don't think about how is it that Zoom is structuring our relation to one another, right? How is it presenting us to one another? Right now, I can see four people on the screen. I'm looking for the most part at Pram and Scott because they just happen to be right in front of where my camera is. And I'm pausing it as I'm talking if to see if Scott nods or if Pram agrees, right? Like, but on the other hand, Kim is kind of invisible, right? It's like he's not even present just by the way that this technology is, is structured, right? We're using PowerPoint for today, which means I'm kind of stuck in this linear way of giving a presentation where one slide comes after another, right? I have to make a deliberate effort if I want to skip over something, right? So we don't think about it because it's in the background, but, but that doesn't mean it's not affecting our way of relating to one another. Now, after Don Eide have been a number of students, probably a really important person for, for a class like this is Peter Paul Verbeek. Um, if you're interested in this kind of stuff and thinking about um, technologies in a phenomenological manner, um, he's written some, some really interesting texts. One, uh, I'm forgetting the title, it has morality in it, materializing morality. It's been a while since I read it. It's a white covered book. Um, just fantastic contemporary work where he also explores other kinds of relations, right? Because there are other technologies that challenge this kind of a framework. All right, I'm just going over this in depth. So the stethoscope is an example of embodiment you know, things like imaging technologies, an example of hermeneutic relation. Things like an isolate as an example of a background technology. Um, and something like the monitor, right, that we use to monitor a child um, can be in the background, but also we can encounter it as something other to ourselves. When we view it as something that's actually disclosing whether we're picking up a child or whether they're okay or so forth. So some technologies challenge these, these ways of, of grouping the technologies. All right, so have I convinced you technologies are everywhere? They're constitutive of our very being in the world. Anyone wanna argue with me? I love a debate. So I would say the techno-ethical question fundamentally considers how does a technology weave into human life, affecting our perception, our decisions, and our actions? And if we're really serious about ethics and technology, we need to actually ask this question. We need to consider how is it that a technology may shape the way that another is present to me, that how I respond to them in a particular way. Right? So it's not just that ethics and technology, you need to think about issues around privacy or individual disclosure or, you know, ethics of data handling, but actually asking how is it that a technology changes the way of human life? Oh, I have this video in here. I love this video. I'm going to share a video. Um, and I've shared it before in this class. It's a bit long. We'll just see how far we get. Um, it's an interview with uh, Bernard Stiedler, uh, Stiedler, Stiedler um, who was a French phenomenologist. And he's also written, he wrote many books before his, his passing. Um, but one thing that he did a very nice way of showing is just how in an originary fashion, technology are part of what makes us human, right? So rather than saying technologies are something that we pick up or add it on, he would instead say things like, we are deficient without technologies, right? So technologies are part of what makes us human and our capacity to embody technologies is part of our humanness. So let me play this video.
Un jour, Zeus a dit à Prométhée, « Le temps est venu pour toi, pour nous les dieux, de faire venir au jour les non-immortels. » Les non-immortels, ce sont les animaux, les hommes. Or, Prométhée, qui est chargé de faire ce travail, a un frère. Ce frère, c'est son jumeau, il s'appelle Épiméthée. Ce frère Épiméthée, il a pour caractéristique d'être le jumeau, le frère jumeau de Prométhée. Il lui ressemble, il est tout à fait son double, mais il est son contraire également. Épiméthée, c'est le dieu du défaut, de l'oubli. Prométhée, c'est celui du savoir, de la maîtrise absolue, de la mémoire totale. Prométhée n'oublie rien, Épiméthée oublie tout. Or, Épiméthée dit à son frère Prométhée, « Zeus t'a chargé de faire quelque chose, je veux m'en occuper, c'est moi, c'est moi, c'est moi qui m'en occupe. » Et comme Épiméthée, c'est le frère un peu simple d'esprit de Prométhée, Prométhée a de l'affection pour son frère. Il n'ose pas refuser, il est d'accord, tant mieux. Donc, Épiméthée va se mettre à distribuer des qualités. Il va donner, par exemple, à la gazelle la vitesse, la gazelle courte et vite. Au lion, la force et l'endurance. À la tortue, la carapace, etc., etc. Bref, il va distribuer des qualités qui sont équilibrées. Je décris la distribution des qualités par épiméthée, c'est l'équilibre écologique de la nature. Le lion court après la gazelle, il mange la gazelle, mais comme les gazelles courent très vite, il y a toujours des gazelles qui se reproduisent, que le lion n'attrape pas, et tout ça, tout va bien. Toutes les espèces sont équilibrées. Donc, Épiméthée distribue toutes les qualités, et puis d'un seul coup, il s'aperçoit qu'il regarde dans son panier, il y a deux qualités. J'ai oublié de garder une qualité quoi. Le panier est vide. Or, oh, il me reste à créer, à, à faire venir au jour, comme dit le grand hein, l'homme, enfin, le mortel. Il y avait encore une espèce à faire venir au jour, mais il n'y a plus de qualité pour lui donner une forme. Du coup, Prométhée est obligé d'aller dans l'Olympe, dans l'atelier des Phaïstos, voler le feu. Le feu qui est évidemment le symbole de la technique, mais qui est aussi le symbole de la puissance de Dieu. Zeus. From the, from the river bottom. I can send you the link or you can look it up on YouTube if you want to see the whole video. Um, I don't know what you think about that video. I, I have to admit it. Maybe it's because of I do neonatology. For me, this is just, it speaks so much or as a nice way of thinking about technologies and humans. When a baby's born, right? A baby can't survive in the world, even if a baby's born at term, right? You wouldn't have a baby born and say, all right, go about, get yourself some food, survive, grow up. Babies are born dependent on their parents, right? Um, in, in this kind of a sense, you know, in our original form, right, as we come into being in the world, we're always dependent on some other thing. Now, I mean, you know, many, many parents, of course, will, will nurse, nurse their babies. Others will use bottle feeding, right? But from very early on, right, in our development, um, we are dependent on, on something other than ourselves right, to get through the day. I like how Stiedler uses this, this myth, right, to try and present man as an originary technical being. That, you know, what is the quality that defines our humanness? Is, is this deficiency? 
this turning towards other things in the world and embodying them into our body, right? So our capacity to grasp tools or other objects and for them to become tools. Right? Now, strictly speaking, Stiegler isn't quite correct, right? If we we're to say, what is the quality that makes us human? We would also recognize that there are different animals that as well can embody technologies, right? Um, and, you know, we don't want to fall victim to some kind of speciesism either, right? But I, I do think he has a nice way of kind of sharing that insight or bringing it to the forward. Uh, these are two other quotes from his, his text, uh, Time and Techniques, or Techniques in Time. Oh my goodness, I, my post-call brain is hurting today. Technologies are not external to our being, rather than are what makes us human, as we are realized as technical beings forever constituted by and constituting technology. This is a really important insight, right? Because not only is he trying to present humans as originally technique or, or technological in our being, but rather he also ultimately expresses, and through this text, he, he explores and shows that as, as humans, we're therefore not static in our nature, right? As we develop new technologies and incorporate them into our individual and social lives, we change the way that we are, right? Which is interesting because children nowadays truly are different from children yesterday's because there are different technologies at play, right? Different technologies shaping their development, right? Relationships are different now than they used to be. You know, can you imagine what it used to be like to be in a long distance relationship where you would have to write a letter and send it across the seas, maybe get a response in weeks compared to the long distance relationships of, of nowadays, right? That can be, you know, senses of intimacy through VR and haptics. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just a different world, right? You know, going out on your own as a teenager, right? Um, to them all. When I was young, you brought a quarter with you in your in your jeans, right? And you phoned your parents when you needed a ride home. You know, nowadays, most teenagers, they have cell phones, right? And most parents press the find my friends, and they know exactly where their kids are. There's a different sense of independence nowadays than there used to be, right? And I'm not saying this in a romantic, nostalgic way, but I'm rather trying to say that this point has a certain truth to it. So this means that as we create technologies, we are also recreating, we are constantly creating the sort of humans that we are or will become. And that's why his story of Prometheus and Epimetheus is so important, because it's a creation story that ultimately casts human beings as technical beings, forever doomed to recreate and create themselves. Any questions or thoughts about that? What I like about this is this also reveals very much so that when we think about who are those individuals with power in our world, right? Who are the influencers in the world? By and large, they're not the researchers who write articles that are published in a journal and sit on some shelf in a library right? If there even are shelves in libraries nowadays, you know, in some virtual shelf. The people that change the world nowadays are the people that design technologies, right? And often how a technology is designed uh, doesn't account for the way in which it's going to be used. Okay. So the next point, uh, techniques constitute our own moral consciousness as they constitute intersubjectivity, historicity, temporality, purpose, meaning, and freedom as constitutive elements. This is really expanding on what I, what I talked about yesterday when we were talking about moral experience. So how is it that you, Pram, or you, Scott, find yourself encountering a situation and saying, you know what, that's a good thing, or that's a bad thing? How is it that you make moral judgments? Yesterday, we were talking about how we make moral judgments 
is in part response to how it is we are brought up in our life, right? Meaning the values that our parents tried to imbue on us intentionally or unintentionally, right? Whether we went to Sunday school or not, right? These different values that are passed on from our culture. But our actual moral, moral experiencing of others is also the subject of technologies, right? And I talked about yesterday how we might try and imagine a machine consciousness, right? Which has some kind of subjective grasping of the world in senses of something being good or something being bad. But our tendency always seems to be to take something technological and reduce it to something human. Human in the sense of non-technological human being. So it's very challenging for us as people to imagine a moral consciousness that differs from our own to the extent that we make machines that deal with moral issues to appear like us. Does that make sense? No. Oh. Now this is way, this slide is becoming way old. Do you guys recognize where this is? Yes, it's Edmonton during like the one week of the year where there's no snow. What else? Like, is, is that the ledge uh, area? That is the ledge area, correct. This is pre-COVID. This is, you talked about uh, images giving hope in our future that are pre-COVID and we have to use them. I will use this as my background. And this doesn't give me hope in the future. This gives me quite the opposite. Um, and I'm expressing that as a moral judgment. Uh, this is a picture of the summer of Pokemon Go. Do you guys remember that? Maybe, maybe not. When everyone and their dog seemed to be taking an iPhone and walking around and trying to catch these Pokemon that weren't really there, right, um, with their phone. And you, I went to the legislature with my oldest son, who was like the rest of them, wanting to collect Pokemon Go. And what are we seeing? People pushing around newborn babies, right? Trying to catch Pokemon Go as their kids are crying, right? Like just such an interesting thing, right? Um, the reason I include it here is sometimes my own sense, and I could be wrong on this, is that when we start thinking about technology, particularly when we start talking about things like AI, we start trying to imagine some kind of post-apocalyptic future where, you know, some kind of intelligence is going to cast judgment on us, right? But perhaps what we should be more concerned about is what we could talk about as some kind of a cyborgian, um, you know, moral experience, right? So, you know, how is it that different technologies are going to shape our understanding of, of what is good or what is bad, right? So it's not so much we have to be worried about a future of technologies governing over us, but rather what exact kind of humans are we creating over time, right? How are we changing the nature of being together? And I don't mean to look at all of the technologies in regretful ways, right? There are certain technologies when you think about it, um, when you now have a sense of closeness to someone who's in a different part of the world, um, who previously seemed very distant, it becomes all the harder to not engage in some kind of action as they are literally starving or living in poverty or some other difficult circumstance, right? Because the technology can make them more present to us, right? But on the other hand, it can also be sad when you realize just in our, our human history, how many technologies ultimately were either developed or you know, promoted some kind of power differentials where one group of people benefited and, and another was disadvantaged. So can we regard contemporary social media, those virtual spaces where code meets conversations expressing a technical exterior, exteriorization formative identity formation on an individual and collective group level? So this is this notion of, well, where is it that morality actually resides? Does it reside within the individual or does it reside within something much broader than myself, 
right? Something intersubjective that is shared between people that's formative of a culture. Um, this morning, I went on the exercise bike and I was re-listening to a lecture by Herbie Hancock, you know, fabulous jazz musician, right? And if you've never listened to him speak on a topic, you're, you're missing out. And he spoke on the ethics of jazz, right? And he's trying to express what is this ethics of jazz, which isn't hopefully with any one musician. It rather reflects this coming together of different musicians, right? Something that somehow over time tends to be understood. Well, what kind of ethics are we creating in virtual environments, right? What kind of ethics are we creating in other kind of shared spaces, which are so dependent on technologies? Next point. Many moral perspectives can be codified into technologies such that designers, engineers have moral ethical responsibilities. Um, when I mentioned Peter Paul Verbeek, this is something that he goes into in his writings, which is, which is really important to note. All right, so these are some classic examples um, about building morality, okay? And these are not originary examples that I came up with. These are examples that if you open a philosophy of technology textbook and they start talking about ethics and technologies in a way that goes beyond simply, you know, issues around privacy and stuff like that, um, but actually deals with it in, in, a, in a sustained fashion, they'll often draw on these examples. So I think for a class like this, it's, it's important to kind of have a sense of some of them, okay? One of the first is uh, Langdon Winner's Bridge. So Langdon Win uh, Winner is a, is a philosopher who wrote about these bridges um, that were designed by Moses um, in the United States. And these bridges, the way he told the story, is that morality was built into them. All right. So what do you, I mean by morality was built into them? So just look at this bridge right? and imagine that a car is driving underneath it. I'm hoping you'll realize that like the high level bridge, right? Routinely, how many of you uh, drive cars? Probably everyone here, right? Look at this assumption I make. Have you ever been driving on the other side of the river and then someone pulls up in this large truck and suddenly all the traffic on 109th street comes to a standstill because they thought they could get their big rig onto the high level bridge? Right? This happens generally once every month or so, right? And it's usually when I'm trying to get from the Royal Alex to the university and I'm on call that night and it's, it's a mess. Um, well, this bridge, what's interesting about the bridge or, or these bridges were the, are that they're constructed in such a way that they actually are quite low to the ground and only a particular kind of vehicle can get under the bridge, right? So sports cars, no problem. Station wagon, no problem you know, Mazda van, if they still exist, no problem, okay? A bus, that becomes an issue, right? Public transit, that's that's trouble, right? They can't get under these bridges. They have to go a different way, all right? Well, why does this reflect to morality? Because these bridges were placed on those roads which gave public access to the beaches, which basically meant that people who were trying to go down to the beach or these particular areas of the city, if they relied on public transit, which at the, this particular time involved people of lower socioeconomic status, um, individuals of so-called color, right? Um, they weren't able to get there, right? So that's what we mean by this bridge, morality is built into it. And then you can start to say that, you know what, it's a good bridge in the sense of it's strong, you can walk over the top of it, but maybe it's a bad bridge in other ways. Okay. Another important way of looking at technologies in the philosophy of technology is after network theory. And um, this can be very useful um, here, humans and technologies are considered as enmeshed or bound up in networks of so-called collectives. And um, Bruno Latour, who's like the father of after-network theory, 
you know, has a lot of very technical terms, um, you know, delegation, translation, composition, black boxing, you name it, programs of agenda, where he he's trying to define the ways that different humans and different technologies come to, to form these networks or programs of action. What's interesting about his writing is that by and large, he doesn't make a distinction between the human and non-human actor. Right? He puts the technology and the human on equal grounds, which just opens up a new way of thinking about morality and technologies. So here's one of his classic examples, right? Bruno Latour's sleeping policemen, which he would also say are designed to reflect a certain morality, right? So what happens in this technology? Generally, in a playground zone or somewhere else, right, um, you would have a policeman or someone, you know, stationed there basically saying, slow down, right? Uh, don't drive too fast. You could run over kids who are at play. This is a neighborhood. You can't drive 80 kilometers an hour in it, right? But instead, what we do is, you know, rather than have people stand there, let's delegate that to something called a speed bump. Right. And, you know, I'm forgetting which language and it's in where these speed bumps are essentially referred to as sleeping policemen, right? Because that is the, the role that they are cast into, right? And essentially now this technology, again, expresses a morality um, whereby you should not drive too fast in this neighborhood, right? These are pre-COVID benches, I guess. I had a post-COVID bench. I don't know if it's still here. Um, you know, you can say all of these different bridges express morality. Not bridges, benches. Benches express morality, right? So look at these benches. What do they allow? Well, they all allow sitting, right? That's what they're designed for. That must be their intention, right? That, you know what, you're waiting in the subway in New York. Um, here, you can sit down and you can wait right? Here's a, a bench in Montreal. Isn't that cool? Montreal is such an artsy city, right? You can sit, you know, take your groceries, put them on the ground and wait, right? Public bench in Tokyo, same thing. Park bench in Edmonton. This is just blocks from my house. I only had to walk there. Um, but all of these benches, benches are also designed with something else in mind, intentionally or unintentionally, right? Um, the New York bench, the public bench in Tokyo, the one in Montreal, if you're someone who's homeless and you're looking for somewhere to sleep, you can't lie down on these benches, right? They're designed for a particular class, a particular way in which they're envisioned to be used, right? It's only the park bench in Edmonton that's, you know, welcoming. This was like from the, just at the start of uh, COVID-19 in Edmonton, where they, they put these on the Jasper Ave bench in front of CIBC, right? So, you know, that part of town does have a, a larger uh, population of uh, people without homes residing there, right? And suddenly to prevent loitering, right? To prevent people from gathering, they put these on the benches, right? For public safety. Well, who's public safety? Who are they thinking of? Who is of value in this situation? Well, it's the patrons of the bank. And generally, if you're a patron of a bank, let's be honest, you usually have money, right? So what kind of morality here are we designing? And, you know, again, I'm, I'm trying to just point towards it because fundamentally what we need to ask in these situations is, well, what does this say about us? Right? How can we reflect on this? Is this a good bench? Is this a bench that you would proud, be proud to have in your community, in your city? So my last point today, look at this. I'm like running way on time. You, you are all being so quiet. I'm going to get in trouble for finishing early. And there's not even two rounds for me to hide behind. All right, so reflection can support how we as a society develop over time. Huh, I didn't even have slides for it. So 
the, essentially what I've been trying to bring out, of course, here is that if we think of what is the role of ethics and technology studies, is that ethics brings possibilities for reflection, right? So when we design a new technology, whether it's a communication technology like an iPhone, right? One for listening to music like earbuds or some device that crosses uses, right? We have an often a particular intention when we're designing it. And often in the consumer world, the intention is we are trying to reach a particular consumer to sell our product, right? But a big insight from technology studies and particularly design studies is that we can never fully anticipate how a technology is going to change the nature of things. So any kind of evidence-based design necessitates reflection on how a design has actually been used, how a technology has been actually imported into life. And then potentially redesign of that product. Now, the question is, who ultimately should have the autonomy or the authority in design? So should it be, you know, large corporations, right? Should it be, I don't know, it used to be the Bill Gates of the world. Who's the, who's the richest man of the world nowadays? Jeff Bezos, is that right? Yeah. Is, is that who you want to trust your morality to, right? Um, these questions need to be asked, right, when we're thinking about technology, particularly when we realize these are not just technologies that we as ourselves as often, you know, thinking, reflecting, adults decide, almost like the Amish, right, do we want to bring this technology into our community? But it's also, do we want this technology to be used by our children, by our loved ones? And do we like how this is changing the nature of things? Um, I'll give you one final concrete example, right? So COVID um, has really brought about classes like this, right? Classes where we're all in different places rather than sharing a common room, right? This class, no, does it, Kim, does this class still have a physical place? It does? Oh, you're muted. That's where the midterm will be. Ah, so the physical place <laughs> turns into an exam hall, right? That's yeah. what it's reverted into, right? Yeah. Oh my goodness, that's a Marshall McLuhan moment. <laughs> so, I mean, classrooms, this is a different kind of classroom, certainly than when I grew up, right? I'm going to be honest with you, right? Um, I do a lot of teaching of the medical students. And attention that we're now, you know, kind of considering or reflecting on as educators is that by and large, people actually do like classrooms like this, right? Why? Because they can attend a class while being on the exercise bike, right? Oh, they don't have to leave their house. They can cook at the same time. Oh, childcare is an issue today, right? So there's many, you know, reasons why. But should we be continuing on with this style of teaching because it's what people want? Or should we be continuing on with this style of teaching because it actually supports better education, right? Do we know that? Do we know that the experience of this class virtually is as good or better than it, when it used to be in person, right? I, I, I don't know that. Have we studied it? The problem is many of us, we didn't collect kind of baseline data before COVID hit, right? It just hit and we just tried to figure out a way of carrying on. We brought Zoom into our educational professional lives. And now that it's here, I'll be honest, many of my colleagues don't want to see it go. We use Zoom now on our daily NICU rounds so parents can join in if they're at home and they can see how their kid is doing and they can talk and be part of medical decision making, which is great. But on the other hand, we do have some parents who almost never come to the NICU. They just join from their kitchen. And you wonder, well, how, how can you, you be there for your child in this moment, right? How, how are you engaged in actually making decisions 
uh, from that perspective of having all the information that's needed if you're not there or if you're there in a different way, right? So, you know, Zoom is like many other technologies. It was brought into workplaces, clinical environments, educational environments as a useful tool, as some way of getting through the pandemic, right? I know Zoom was also used before the pandemic, but let's be honest, their shares must have gone up, I don't know how many fold when the pandemic hit. They benefited from the pandemic, right? And now we're stuck in that situation of actually asking, are we happy with how life has become as a result? Knowing that sometimes individuals' perspectives are, are, are based on their own beliefs, um, but not necessarily based on evidence. So with that in mind, I've talked way more than I meant to, almost an hour. We have the next 20 minutes or however long Kim says is okay for any kind of discussions, questions, and comments. I'll stop my screen share. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to kind of reflect on Zoom. When the pandemic began, I had this idea of using Zoom for slideshows. You know, you could put a lot of content there and if you got out of the way, you could actually use it as opposed to PowerPoint. And, you know, you you can um, actually use PowerPoint for your virtual background. Zoom now allows that. I was excited that as I started to talk about this, the PC and the Mac versions of Zoom, which used to be quite different, converged. So they were all the same. You had the same number of virtual backgrounds on both. I thought, boy, Zoom is really listening to me. So then Zoom contacted me and said that their leadership was interested in my ideas. So they had a sort of interlocutor guy talk with me for 58 minutes. But of course, the CEO and stuff doesn't have that much time. So they technologically distilled those 58 minutes down to 10 and then circulated it to the leadership. And my message was sort of that they need a higher purpose. And you know they're well positioned to take on a higher purpose. And Boy, I, tell you, I don't think that made it, any sense to the leadership. That was absolutely different from what they were thinking. So, you know, it was kind of an exciting moment. You, you could say, well, you know, if you had given them some middle ground, <laughs> a little bit of a higher purpose, but a lot of money, you know, or something like that, uh, a, a way that you, you could really... Uh, make this very remunerative and have have a sense of higher purpose that maybe, yeah. But anyway, nothing really happened, but for one brief shining 10 minute period, <laughs> I had had the attention of the leadership of Zoom. And so that was, that was interesting. And, and you might think back, well, did I really, uh, make a serious mistake? Should that have happened? Should Zoom be a big moral player in our lives? I don't think so. I don't think they ever thought so. <laughs> I don't think it was destined to happen. But anyway, that's my story it's, about Zoom. It's funny. I'm in the clinical world. Um, you know, one thing that is really apparent to me, a lot of meetings that you schedule um, meetings to often talk about maybe a challenging patient or clinical situation, or maybe something challenging that's happening in the unit, you know, staff morale, moral distress, you name it. Right. Some of the most important conversations that happen are the ones that happen in the five minutes before the meeting starts and the five minutes after the meeting ends, right? Yeah. As people are gathering and people are leaving. But with you know, the way that Zoom is now integrated into people's eye calendars and everything else, I'm noticing, I'm not sure if you're noticing the same thing, but more and more people come to a meeting exactly when it starts, yeah. you know, five seconds before it starts. So in a way, 
something that's been lost. I don't think would ever have been anticipated in designing Zoom way back in the day were the casual conversations, right? That happen when you begin to schedule your day so tightly, right? Just to the minute, right? The other thing that's happened, of course, is um, it's now so much easier to schedule meetings. So again, Kim, I'm not sure about you, but I seem to now have twice as many meetings, if not three <laughs> times as many meetings as I had pre-pandemic. Yeah. Because anytime someone wants to meet, I can always say, sure, I can fit in 20 more minutes in this day or 15 more minutes this day. And before you know it, on a day like today, um, you know, I've been in meetings since 7 a.m., just one after another. Well, that also changes that nature of, of work, right? Because you no longer have those 15 minutes where you're walking to, you know, the medical sciences building or the half an hour when you're walking somewhere else or driving somewhere. You're not necessarily caught in your thoughts because you're just moving from one thing to another. And again, I mean, I'm being romantic about it in that sense of nostalgic. But these aspects of, you know, kind of looking back and saying, you know, what might be missing from, from someone's life, this is an opportunity for redesign, right? And also an opportunity for reflecting and saying, should we have a, you know, meeting once a week in person for this express purpose, right? Yeah. Well, you know, one, one of the things that, that happened with the Zoom leadership is I got talking about BAMF and the BAMF Center and whether they should invest in a building there. Mm. Well, that, that may seem to you like not something very specific, but it is actually because there are not going to be any new buildings there. The BAMF Center is sort of planned with a hundred years scale, yeah. <laughs> done their thing. So there was only actually one building that they could contribute significantly to a walkway around and that was it <laughs> anyway, that's the outcome of that but you're but you're absolutely right i i would say I, I learned a lot about the zoom leadership philosophy through through exploring these things and the one area where what you describe about those productive conversations when people are waiting before the meeting or after the meeting ends, that still occurs in truly international meetings. We have something called GLOMCON, which discusses kidney medicine sort of worldwide. And it's truly worldwide. The people coming there from all over the earth and part of the fun of it is just seeing each other beforehand. <laughs> I, for the first time, had two people in the same Zoom square last week, and there was excitement about that. Yeah, so you, you can still do it, but not for local or regional or pure you know, Canadian meetings. But in a larger sphere, interesting things still happen before and after the meeting when it's... Uh, truly international and i mean yeah. you can see that people i think reflecting on you know conferences for that you know reason like people why do people go to conferences when you think about it there's something ethically problematic about conferences right you're using public money to pay for researchers to fly around the world leaving a horrid carbon footprint right by taking airfare and everything else to yeah. spend 50 minutes sharing some paper that they wrote that probably people would read anyway uh, if it's really important just by going up on PubMed right so it's it's a little bit you could say is is this actually an appropriate way to spend public dollars um, particularly when conferences are funded uh, from things like CIHR grants or, or shirt right. grants or other things but um on the other hand they do lead to networking to collaboration right, right. so People who are designing conferences are now thinking maybe we can find a way of having people, you know, casually interact with one another. We'll randomly put them in little pods or breakout rooms as the conference is starting. So they have that sense oh, yeah. of, of conversing. So you do see people thinking reflectively. So I, I think it's important, but I, I guess my, my uh, the point that I try and make in a talk like this is that 
Um, ethics doesn't begin with design. It's there, right? Yeah. But there's an opportunity for ethical reflection as technologies are being employed and we see how the world shifts and changes, which should ultimately reinform design. But what's challenging is who ultimately has this kind of decision making, right? Like who's holding the purse? Who's making these decisions? Yeah. You know, Kim and I can, you know, lament or talk about <laughs> ideas that we have. You know, think about somewhere like Banff, right? You know, who actually is on the board of the Banff? center who actually makes the decision about you know how many buildings can be built right um you know it's there's an interesting story going on about Banff um, this is being recorded right yep. oh well I'll probably I'll probably get knocked off <laughs> um you know so this group of individuals who has a lot of wealth within Alberta you know essentially has secured the ability to um you know build a, a gondola in, in Banff. Uh, and then also um, they own the various parking lots and, and whatnot outside of Banff, right? And what they're doing is they're lobbying that nothing but public transportation should be allowed in Banff, hmm. right? And you might say, well, this is great. It's more environmental. But if you take a step back, you also see, well, this group is benefiting because <laughs> they're the ones who own these big parking lots in Calgary and everywhere else where people are going to put their cars when they go to Banff, right? Yeah. So it's it's often a false sense of a public consultation, depending on, um, you know, I don't want to sound all big brother-like, but one does have to ask that question when it comes to technology, right? Oh. Um, who is benefiting from these different technologies and in what ways? When you talked in the beginning about what is purely human, we don't think about pheromones much anymore. We don't share them as often as we used to because there are fewer face-to-face. -face. But, it, you know, that's a part of decision-making, probably at a subconscious level, that we will likely be missing in the future. You know, I don't know what role it plays now. You, you can think about the NICU and when you have parents there and so on, whether, you know, pheromones are actually contributing at all, but it's a part of our, you know, what we biology. Used to, what we used to do in the NICU, and in fact, there's still NICUs who do this, is they would take these small washcloths and then the parents would take these washcloths and it sounds gross. They put them under their armpits right. or some other place. Right. And then we take that same washcloth and we put it in the isolate with the baby. Because what right. we found is that even though a baby might be new to this world, they have some sense already of what is familiar, what is constant, right. um, even before birth, right? So there's studies showing, um, you know, babies as young as like 32 weeks if they're born early and they hear their um you know mother's voice or their father's voice that they'll respond in a different way compared to a stranger right mm -hmm. like you know i'm not saying that they are thinking they're having reminiscences in memory i think that would be a, a false jump to make and say that you can say that a child at that age experiences memory in that way but what we can say is there is some sense of familiarity there right now, what's interesting, of course, is, you know, when you think about how people smell, how people smell, that sounds really weird. Well, how do they smell? Well, isn't that a consequence of what clothes you buy about, um, you know, whether you can afford to have multiple showers a day, whether you work in an environment that you're allowed to wear things like perfumes and colognes. I mean, there's, there's, you know, I would say our pheromones are very much technologically constructed as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Any other comments? Kim uh, and I don't need to just talk. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, kind of just going back to what you were talking about of like who has power and decision making in terms of technology and deploying technology and and ultimately how like their choices kind of affect the people that use it. Um, I think it, like I have I kind of while I was hearing you and Kim discuss about that kind of have like a interesting thought because like I, I recently finished an internship at 
one of the tech companies that are not doing too hot. So I was kind of, you know, I was kind of there when, you know, the stock was tanking and, and, and executives and directors were kind of scrambling to kind of, you know, figure out what would be the direction that would make sense for the company. And I think it's like, it, it starts to become quite complicated, right? Because, you know, say, um, like this was a social media platform and really the only way for social media platforms to make rev or to generate revenue is through ads, right? But obviously now ads, like there's a huge controversy about them, about targeting ads and, and things like that. But it's also like, you know, say you're the CEO of a large corporation like that, that really depend on ad revenue to really kind of make ends meet in terms of generating revenue and satisfying investors, which ultimately, you know, brings in the money to pay your employees and things like that. Right. So it's like, okay, like, will I kind of do what's like not best for my users so that my company can survive. Right. Cause that's kind of the, you know, their hands are kind of behind their backs where it's like, well, they can't really generate money and keep people employed. And, you know, we see all these layoffs um, and things like that. So now it raises kind of like, like an ethical discussion of like, like, is it right? Like, it, like who, like, who are we serving? And like, what's, what's kind of like the, the line in the sand of like, what's right or wrong? Like how far can you take it so that, you know, you can, you can keep people employed and, you know, keep and so people can, you know, provide for their families, but it's like, you know, we we have seen like a lot of malicious um methods of you know targeting ads and things like that so yeah it's just kind of a interesting um idea that kind of popped into my head um when i was hearing you and kim discuss about that yeah i'm i'm glad that ideas are popping into your head honestly it, for, for me like why i would like to do these kind of seminars is if it leads to future designers, decision makers, physicians, whatever, um, you know, thinking about these kind of considerations, because there aren't, there aren't right answers to, to any of them, right? Because, you know, if, if you're a business owner, you have multiple responsibilities, right? You have responsibilities to your family, right? You have responsibilities probably to your shareholders, to your partners, to your employees, to your customers, right? Who do you decide are you most responsible for? Well, the ethics is you're responsible to all of them, right? And it's not a question of who you're not responsible to. Sometimes it's who you're more responsible to. But that's also deserves reflection in and of itself. And then it becomes also a question for, for people who will decide to, you know, visit a certain company, right? So, you know, say a CEO of a, a uh, popular grocery chain, I don't know, the Friesen Brothers, um, is known to, I don't know, support, you know, heavily the UCP party, right? Um, but I really like the the little chocolate drops that they sell in the bakery session. Do, do, do I no longer go there as, as a potential patron because I disagree with the CEO? Well, how does that impact on all the, you know, everyday people who work there? many of whom have similar political views to myself, right? Who are trying to make, you know, money for their family. So how do you act? So, um, you know, some, there are of course very conscientious or conscious consumers, right? And there's others who don't think about this, but uh, my contention is the, is, is the world needs more people to at the very least consider these situations, recognize, and at some point you do need to act. At some point you do need to buy your groceries from somewhere right? At some point, you do need to support some companies. You do have to use things like Zoom if you want to finish this course, right? But you can reflect on the ways in which it it changes things. Yeah, the same thing has to do with uh, choosing leaders. It was sort of interesting. So I, I was the chair here in 1987. And in 2007, I applied to be chair again, and when I talked to the dean at that time, he had what he thought was a very challenging question. Hadn't I been here long enough that if things got bad, I could just walk, you know? 
the problem with me as a leader is I wasn't hungry enough that that you know I since I had already been lead, leader before and so on that my life situation was not desperate enough <laughs> I would need to keep on working I, I I found that really really amusing but I guess it is one way to look at things but then you would never choose anybody for leadership in 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 the later years of life never ever because they're not hungry and you know desperate enough yeah so. it's funny there are some areas of medicine um, which are oversubscribed in the sense of they produce more trainees than there are positions for them right right a, a, t a typical example would be something like pediatric ICU. Isn't that kind of crazy in a way to think that we're training more doctors than we currently can hire in a particular specialty when there's doctor shortages across the country, right? Um, so do those physicians who are now over 50 paid off their debts, their kids have gone through college, whatever, they're in a financial situation that they can retire. Do they have ethical responsibilities to free up that position? Get out of the way. Graduate? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, do we have responsibilities yeah. when we're in a leadership position to, um, you know, create openings for future leaders, right? So, I mean, these are, you know, ethics is everywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah. You can't get around it. Um, that's what makes it so interesting. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I think like for me, I've always kind of took like, you know, very rigorous technical courses in the past. And it's just recently that I've started taking ethic, like, you know, classes where, you know, we think about, you know, ethics and things like that. And, you know, and it's like really interesting, right? Because, you know, you, you gain all these insightful ideas of like, you know, when you, you gain all these insightful ideas and that that are you know important of how we reflect and think about you know decisions that we make and things that are going on in our lives but you know you kind of i think what you said uh about how like if you're grocery shopping and you're gonna like you you have to act right like you, you have to eventually go somewhere to buy these groceries and i think for me for a long time when i thought about these like ethical theories and ideas it's like okay like yeah like these are really great um super interesting and you know i could just would love to like keep discussing about them but it's like where does it kind of you know when can you actually use it practically and in, in your work and like last class i asked like oh, okay like these are cool cool this is some cool stuff but like how does it affect your work and i think what you just said about like it's it's kind of um not not always just about using all these ethical theories and ideas to make a, a right decision but it's also okay to just um use them to just kind of recognize and reflect what's going on and and that's like totally fine too right like it's not always about how how can i use all this knowledge to make you know a, de a definitively right decision and i felt like i always kind of approached it that way just because you know i always took math courses where it's like, you know, there's always a definitive answer, right? And so, yeah, this is like very interesting where it's like, it's okay not to have a definitive answer, especially for something like ethics where it gets so, you know, convoluted sometimes, but rather just use it as a way of reflection and kind of use it to understand how things operate. And yeah. So if you think about high impact education, it's, education that changes human behavior, maybe right away or maybe with some you know, delay. And one of the things that this teaching session, I think illustrates is the value of surprise and things from left field. I think somebody who hasn't thought very much about what the title means you know, might just accidentally start listening to this, get really fascinated with the newness of the ideas and how these ideas are not just the same old, same old, but quite different from what they have ever thought of before. So in that way, this teaching session might 
change human behavior in a positive way more than others where the ideas are quite predictable, you know, that without listening to the lecture, you can write down what you think the content is. The other thing that's sort of interesting is in the videos, the YouTube description, I used to do that by listening to the whole video and writing down what occurred at certain times and having an actual, you know, complete table of contents. <laughs> and people who don't like videos very much would not watch the video at all. Just copy that summary. <laughs> They've got it. They've got the distilled essence of what that video would have been about if they had watched it. So now what I do, and what's a lot of fun really, and there's a much more human interactivity, is look at the audience retention peaks, say three days or later after you post the video, and just put little snippets of text from each of those peaks. And it becomes a kind of mysterious document where you wonder what's in between, you know? And it makes people want to watch the video a lot more. Whereas that old standard table of contents was a, was a killer really for getting people to watch the videos. This is a kind of stream of consciousness, mysterious thing that, that, that I think brings more people. <clears throat> well i think we're at 320 so at that point i'm yeah. going to say thank you so much for having me in your class yeah um i Great know there session. always has to be testable content and i don't worry about such things so <laughs> i just make sure that the questions i give um to kim ultimately are markable if that makes sense yeah <laughs> um, rather than necessarily, I would love for everyone to write an essay, but uh, but that won't happen. So anyway, have a wonderful day. And uh, if at any point you ever want to chat to me, please feel free to look me up and uh, right? be to meet. Okay, and we'll see you next term. Yeah, thanks. That, that was a great session. Okay, everybody. And the ones of you who have not identified your final topic, if, if you would do that, that would be useful. Thank you very much. Okay, have a good weekend.